Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Nanawali Nambri people's land, who Nanawali Nambri people whose lands I am on, and lands and country across Australia. And I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that the country we all meet on, whether it's virtually or physically, was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. As migrant and refugee women particularly, we are beneficiaries of settler, settler colonialism and systems built on disposition of the First Nations people. Um, thank you for joining us. I'll start by a brief uh, introduction of the Harmony Alliance for you. For those of you who are new and haven't joined us before, the Harmony Alliance is one of the six national women's alliances representing voices of migrant and refugee women at the national level. We are a membership-based organization um, and have um, close to um, 150 members at the, at the moment, which includes organizational and individual members. And um, you're also welcome to um, apply for the membership if uh, you're interested in being a part of the Harmony Alliance. Um, you can find the application forms and criteria to be to, to be a member of the Alliance on our website. Um, I am Sana Ashraf, my, uh, I am Senior Policy Officer at the Harmony Alliance. Um, and today I'm going to stand in for Maria Dimopoulos, the Chair of Harmony Alliance, who had a family emergency at the last moment and won't be able to make it to um, chair the session. So um, yeah, I, I'm just um, standing in her place today and I'll facilitate and moderate the session. Um, this is the second webinar in our intersectionality discussion series. I uh, see a lot of people uh, who are joining today also attended the first webinar, which was two weeks ago, so we're doing it fortnightly. Um, but I'll, uh, there are, again, a lot of new people, so I'll give a brief overview of what the discussion series is about, and then we'll talk more about today's webinar. So the series of discussions came out of our um, long-standing and um, commitment and a long time work on the topic of intersectionality more broadly and also with the specific aim of embedding intersectionality in our work as Harmony Alliance and creating um, guidance and guidelines for wider policy and practice sectors in Australia as well. Um, today's webinar is the second in the series. The first was focusing on our position of privilege and um, relative privilege um, in the context of the stolen lands that we live on and call home. So for us, intersectionality came to, um, the, 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 it's, living in Australia, it became really important to start any conversation about intersectionality by acknowledging that we are beneficiaries of the, and we are part of the settler colonial system here. Um, so today's webinar is, um, having set the scene and having acknowledged the ac acknowledged our position more broadly, today's webinar is focusing on intersection, intersections of multiple forms of systemic discrimination against migrant and refugee women more specifically. So um, the specific systemic discrimination um, that we are looking at today is racism, sexism, ableism, and homophobia, and how they intersect um, in shaping the experiences and lives of migrant and refugee women in Australia. We have a wonderful panel today and I would really like to thank everyone on the panel for taking out the time and committing to the cause and joining us today. Um, I'll provide a brief introduction of all the panelists, but um, th I'm sure they will uh, introduce themselves and offer more of um, what, they, what their expertise is and what they're working on. Um, in, in, in the on talking points. So I would like to start by introducing um, Dr. Judy Tang, um, who is a commissioner at the Victorian Multicultural Commission and the president of the Australian LGBTQI Multicultural Council. Judy is also a clinical neuropsychologist and is the convener of the APS Psychology and Cultures Interest Group and the Psychology and Aging uh, Interest Group as well. Her passions lay in advocacy for mental health, LGBTIQ, aging, and cultural diversity and equality. She was awarded Globe's uh, LGBTI Person of the Year in 2019 and was awarded, awarded a VMC Multicultural Champion in 2018. 
Nia Dole uh, Nguyen is an Australian lawyer and human rights advocate who was born in a refugee camp in Ethiopia of a family fleeing the Second Sudanese Civil War. She works as a commercial litigator in Melbourne and is a regular mm -hmm. media commentator and um, winner of many awards and Nia Dole has an amazing, uh, ha has a wonderful public profile and presence which um, all of you um, would be aware of and she doesn't need much introduction in that space. Um, Dr. Ruth de Souza is a Vice Chancellor's Fellow at RMIT University based in the School of Art and Design and Creative Practice Enabling Capability Platform. She is a nurse, academic and community engaged researcher in gender, race, health and digital technologies. Ruth is also an uh, honorary senior research fellow uh, at the Center for Digital Transformation of Health and the at the University of Melbourne. She has uh, written some amazing pieces um, on her blog about intersectionality lately as well. So I would really recommend going and reading her work um, on this topic more broadly. Dr. Shakira Hassan um, is the fourth panelist and she is the author of From Victims to Suspects, Muslim Women Since 9-11 and a contributor to the anthology and uh, Me Too Stories from the Australian Movement. She's a research fellow at the University of Melbourne and received the 2019 Brenda Gabe Leadership Award from Women with Disabilities Victoria. So now having uh, introduced the panelists and before moving on to the discussion um, and the really important questions that we want to um, we want to discuss and cover today, I would like to acknowledge that any conversation about racism against migrant and refugee women in Australia is relative because racism we experience cannot be in any way equated to racism against the indigenous peoples in Australia. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and address the fact that we do not have a First Nations person on the panel, but we have had these conversations in the background with them. And um, the, the message that we have been getting is that they want us to acknowledge our position of relative privilege without burdening th them, with having to explain racism against them in our spaces or in our conversations every time. It is exhausting for them and um, they find uh, they find they have much more important work to do and uh, we acknowledge and respect that. So uh, with, with that respect, we also respect that uh, our uh, acknowledge that our experiences of racism should not be and cannot be conflated with the historical and systemic racism against um, Aboriginal owners of lands in Australia. On that note, I will turn to our panel and start today's discussion. Um, and just a housekeeping note uh, for the question, uh, for, for any questions that arise during the discussion, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll get to the questions. Um, um, we'll have plenty of time for questions in the end, so we'll get to them soon. Um, and now turning to the panel, I would really like to start by asking um, a very basic but extremely important question that I was saying to them earlier um, is still misunderstood and there is a lot of work, a lot of understanding required on that. It is unfortunate that we still have to talk about these issues, but it is important. So the question that I would like to start with is, what does discrimination and violence against women look like when it is driven by a combination of racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination? Um, can I uh, ask Judy, um, Tang to start the discussion. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. And I did sort of mention to everyone um, to feel free to pipe in so we can make this move more of a conversation. And, and I'm happy to um, sort of bounce, uh, you know, views, views and experiences and, and information with each other as well. So feel free to ask questions and contribute as, as we go along. But thank you very much to um, <clears throat> to the Alliance to, to having me here today and having these wonderful people. The, the question itself, for me, it depends on the setting, I suppose, and I, and I, and I know everyone knows this as well. Um, I, I feel like that when there's the additional isms that come on top of it, um, it, it compounds the experience, it compounds that violence, it compounds that discrimination, um, whether it be um, in some ways where, you know, a person, it might start off with um, 
discrimination where you can start bouncing off and it creates a, a negative loop, a negative cycle on top of that. Um, on the other hand, what can, that you can also do is to start creating layers of layers of inequality and, and, and barriers on top of the existing barriers that are there. So for example, if we talk about, you know, just sexism um, to begin with, but then when you add a layer of racism on top of that, then now they've got like two barriers, for example, to, to overcome. Um, and it not, doesn't necessarily mean one plus one is two. It could be a one plus one is 10 for that matter, in terms of um, accessing um, services or, or being having a chair at, you know, a chair at the table, um, as they say. So for me, that's, um, depending on the setting, that's how discrimination and violence against women could look like and does look like when it's driven by a combination of all these things on top of that. Thank you, Judy. That, that's a very, um, really concise and really um, well articulated, ex articulated explainer of the very basic concepts that we're trying to grasp. Uh, can I ask Nerdo, uh, you to please weigh in on what you think about this? And, and, and you can add to what Judy has already said as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, obviously there is different types of violence that we all um, um, aware of. So there's kind of the verbal violence and then there's physical violence. Um, um, and then maybe micro microaggressions and that's a side issue. But I'll try and illustrate my points through examples of how um, the different differences that an individual bring, whether the difference of race or, or gender or sexuality um, or able body um, um, kind of layer up. Um, so there is a research that was done by Amnesty International about the presence of, of women online. And so this is, this is now, in, I'm, I'm speaking now in relation of say, say verbal abuse. And it shows that the, the, the group that, you know, that women generally, despite their political leaning, receive a significant amount of abuse online than say men. And then it went farther on and say that the people that experience most of abuse, about 80% of the abuse online, but predominantly black women. And that was quite targeted um, uh, abuse. So when we talk about, say, for example, women use of platforms like social media uh, platforms, and say, for example, uh, Twitter as one space, you notice that I know a lot of, a lot of women of color whose views are really interesting and amazing, and they are in positions of power that have decided not to use that platform at all because of the consequences of constantly having to engage with, with racist abuse. Because it's not the fact that they're just women um, who, are, who can, be, can, can be problematic, you're a woman with an opinion, it's also the fact that they're different looking women. And so their occupation of that space that all of us share becomes really complicated by that additional layer of, 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 being, um, of being a person of color. And then of course, if you experience certain forms of disabilities, then social media itself might not even be accessible in the first place. You know, if you have visual impairment or hearing impairment and it's not built in a way that kind of caters for, for, for those needs or doesn't take them into account, then it means that that platform itself, in terms of looking at the example of our intersex, is that you would have probably no or limited access to that space. Um, in terms of, uh, let's look at how that then occurs in terms of just physical violence, for example. We know that as women, uh, that women experience a significant amount of the domestic abuse that occur. We're losing two women, two women on a week in Australia due to domestic abuse. And we know that COVID-19 itself has, has made those situations worse and that abuse within home is likely to, to occur um, at much significant rate. But then because of the way in which, um, the way in which um, uh, COVID-19 has been racialized, it also means that if you, for example, again, seeing the intersectionality, that as a woman, you might not even be safe at home, but you might also not be safe outside the home if you happen to be a woman of, of, of color who's from in, in an Asian background or Asian looking, or in fact, the way it has progressed more recently to say South Sudanese and Muslim women. And we've seen that where they, they intersect, where things intersect again, where Muslim women wearing scarf become are not safe in public spaces because they're a visible example of people that can be can be targeted. So intersectionality, in a way, I mean, it sounds big as a theoretical concept, 
But if you look at the kind of day-to-day -day examples and the experiences in people's life, it's quite obvious. Until I had children, I did not know how the whole world around me was built for an able body. You know, and, and I, I remember just, I, I could turn up to a train station and just run up the stairs without a second thought about how would somebody use this space if they didn't have a body that has been catered for as my able body had been. And when I had children, and that's just a small experience of it, I remember being stuck in train station because I, could, I didn't know where the lifts were. I didn't know where, they, you know, and all of a sudden I realized something that used to take me a second all of a sudden now has become a way of thinking and strategizing what I'm going to do and all this. But, but I had assumed that the world, you know, was fair. I had assumed that you could, you know, uh, go to restaurants and walk in because I'd never tried to fit a, a pram through the door of a restaurant or to find out that most restaurants don't have sufficient space for sitting with two kids or, you know, all these little things that I was able to do because I was able-bodied and I was, you know, at that time a single person became quite a very different experience. So sometimes the ability not to see the intersections of discrimination does come just from our own assumption as human beings thinking that how we experience the world is how other people experience the world too. Thank you. That's really, that's really the crux of it. And we have been wanting examples and that's what people have been asking for and to to give those examples from lived life and how it impacts in your everyday life and what are the assumptions that we make even as even as we go about as um, migrant and refugee women women of color we are still making a lot of assumptions about things that we are not subject to things that we may not be experiencing as underprivileged or disadvantaged and that's where the understanding of intersectionality becomes really important because you could be a part of a group where you are traditionally uh, not the privileged group, but still there are certain things you're taking for granted because you're not looking at the experiences of everyone else. And with that, I would, um, can I please ask you Shakira to um, share what you think about this and would you be able to share some some examples and some more of your experiences to add to the conversation. Yes, I'm interested to hear that reflection on it anymore. You can hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, given that I've been this week, the prohibition into abuse, discrimination, kind of people with disabilities has been hearing this about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people with disabilities. And there's some extremely predictable, but nonetheless disturbing testimony from disabled women at, that, at, at those hearings. I have a real disability myself. I have multiple cirrhosis. I acknowledge that that's a very different experience from other disabled women, extremely Predictable, but not I have a visible of the COVID kind of that identity there. Extremely disabilities that I've had that identity their whole life. I've had to deal with this stuff. But anyway, to swing back, um, yeah, that um, reflection on access, on physical access, and on the online space too. Um, it was valid for me in a way to hear these other women thoughts that I've been having since the outset of the pandemic, which was partly, well, all this um, working from home, all these Zoom meetings, all these um, provisions that were made because of the pandemic, they were measures that disabled people have been campaigning for for years and were told was too expensive, too much hassle, worked very well, and now all of a sudden they're in place. So on, and we're going about fucking time, excuse me, but on the other hand, we have sisters all over. Everybody was saying, well, we tried that. It was a mega hassle. And uh, we don't, you know, we, okay, we'll keep it a bit because it makes the overheads a bit cheaper. But on the whole, it's just hey, things were being done before. But talking this, so on the one hand, she's largely, you know, housebound. Um, all of a sudden, she can participate because there's that, well, just so much more entertainment or anything else online so much more 
but at the same time, she had been going physically out at least sometimes, and now she's worried that being completely invisible, every, have, seeing disabled people out and about and in the workplace, people will forget about mental disabilities and feel like you stand up way too much. And if we bring that into how yeah, that um, it was validating for me in a way to hear these other identity, the sex or other forms of initially early on, disabled people were very far ahead of the curve in realizing how much danger the pandemic could face because many of us are you know compromised as well or high risk even as other women and women too told telling our commission we won't survive many of us we get that far so we're you know um provisions that were made before yes and the told was too isolating for that fucking time excuse the language so when we tried that it was a mega hassle and it's a bit cheaper but on the whole let's just go back to the ways because there's you know, well, just so much happening for her but at the same time she had but on the other hand we have quasi accidental mostly guys who would just veer out of their way to you know we, okay we'll keep it beat we've got the disability um identity in the sense of she hop against how much danger the pandemic me or and I'll breathe or cough or entertainment apart from anything else and women there's other women and many of us where we get that virus and happen. but at the same time she had a mandated isolation about it in the workplace and we'll feel like you stand out way too our intersect how the disability sort of other forms like initially the exact background might be who'd had much more aggressive harassment and so I asked and other friends who were basically of white appearance but wearing face masks were not getting the same level of harassment but also but I also use a standing crutch and visibly disabled women too who were wearing face masks were and but were not of you know but but were basically white or white passing were not reporting that kind of harassment either and again at the royal commission there was talk about disabled women during the panic shopping being just shoved physically pushed out of the way you know aggressively trampled and um so it's um yeah but I'll, anyway, I'll let Ruth have, have, have the spotlight for a bit. Um, but anyhow. But I do very much feel, well, I do feel like, because I do look a bit in the carby, especially the first face mask I had was black and I was wearing with a dark hoodie. It did look, I, as I said to my friend, I realised that I look like a media representation of the midlife jihadi bride here. So, and I also noticed that, that, um, more conservative religious Muslims were showing me a level of friendliness that I wasn't used to seeing. So that's the upside. I was getting a lot of, hey, sister. <laughs> okay. So there was that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shakira. Hi, everybody. Uh, just want to acknowledge uh, where I'm speaking from today. I'm on uh, Bunwarung land at Western Port. Uh, and I have patchy internet, so hopefully I'll sound okay, but I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat in case I fizzle out. Um, just really want to acknowledge any Aboriginal and, and First Nations people who are listening and acknowledge this is land that's never been ceded and I'm an uninvited guest on this land. Um, I think this is a really, really important conversation uh, and I just really want to acknowledge all the people that have tuned in to listen. I see that there are uh, old friends from Aotearoa, Kia ora. Uh, great to have you here. And um, it's a really special thing to be able to have this conversation. And um, I think, you know, just building on Shakira's point, when you think about the people who are most um, marginalised from... Uh, institutions and services um, and somehow think about oh from the US too and, and think about you know what does it mean to be inclusive um, which kind of leads me to my point the points that I want to make about intersectionality um, and I know there's a few people that are listening that didn't come to the first one so I just want to do a super fast recap um, and just say there are four things that I think are important about intersectionality to me. Um, and the first is just the refusal that there's a predetermined hierarchy of vulnerable groups. Um, second, a rejection of universality. And I want to return to that in a minute that, that you know, 
all women have the same experience or people who identify as women or all people of color are the same, you know, so it rejects that universal idea. Thirdly, that um, the risks and impacts um, are shaped by a web. And um, I think Judy spoke about this beautifully, you know, it's not additive, it's kind of the intersection of all these different aspects of our social identities that have an impact. And then all those kinds of um, identities are shaped by processes and structures of power. So, you know, we must think about capitalism, globalization, patriarchy, as Nadol was talking about, racism, nationalism, xenophobia, and they create an interplay of kind of advantages and, and vulnerabilities. Um, and I think um, that's really important. And so I wanted to talk about a different kind of violence, and, and Nadol has talked about um, institutional violence in terms of platforms. Um, Shakira has talked about, um, you know, ableist kind of mechanisms that um, prevent people from participating. And I guess I was thinking of the health sector because that's my background and how um, all these isms are the kind of dominant discourses that we're all floating in, you know, that unless um, we are shaken in some way or interrupted, as Nyadol um, said in her uh, example of becoming a parent and, and suddenly realizing what a disabling environment um, she was in, you know, in trying to get a train. Um, they're embedded in our institutions and in our processes and our mechanisms because there's a focus on often a singular access um, of identity. And my interest has been in the kind of violence of very ordinary and everyday processes that wouldn't actually be thought of as violent and um, discriminatory because um, they're just how we do business, you know? And so um, what I'm interested in is how do we figure out who they are centering? You know, who's that imagined user? And uh, in a settler nation, um, you know, those parameters have been set by the, by the colonizers, you know, where we're not yet post-colonial, we're a white settler nation with structures of power that privilege a certain group. Um, so I think that um, that's probably a, quite a good place to stop so other people can get a word in, but I just wanted to say those things as kind of framing the way that I think about intersectionality. I was going to add to that, Ruth, because I think it's really great that you mentioned um, privilege into it, because we all have different levels of privilege. And I think what happens is with privilege comes um, an accidental ignorance of, of, uh, of the power and, and, and the level that you are on. So, you know, I, I think it was great if we're talking about examples, you know, it's something as simple as, let's just say, you know, um, you, you, you're at a work meeting and it's a women's work meeting. Um, but then when you bring intersectionality of race, for example, uh, perhaps, you know, a, a, a woman of colour is less likely to be given um, more of a platform to speak, even though technically, you know, um, according to um, the women who, who, white women, for example, would not, would have thought that, that if that, they would have provided a level playing ground. However, because coming from a society where it's not, it's more like, you know, it's in the back of your mind um, to have these sort of racist or homophobic or ableist views um, without you realizing you're perhaps, you know, not giving that space to, to these women with these other intersectionalities. Um, not on purpose. And so it's not saying, you know, here, here are these women just doing these things, but without, understanding your own privilege and the potential blind spots that come with that means that you are participating um, unwillingly in discriminatory behavior. Could I just also uh, jump in there um, and, and, and kind of take on that, 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 that topic about um, uh, privilege. The best way it's been summarized by somebody else is that we all have the ability to oppress. Um, and I think that's both, it can be a very confronting statement to say because there are moments in which all of us experience a sense of powerlessness and, or, or just a sense of lack of control of the world. Say, how can I possibly be in a position to oppress somebody else? My life is already as it is and probably objectively hard. Um, but it took me a while uh, 
to learn that I participate in a form of oppression by the means in which I came to this country as an immigrant who came in. I didn't come here through a process set up by indigenous people. I came through here through a process set up by a, a, a settler system that colonized and dispossessed a whole group of people of their land and diminished their way of life. And so what I stepped in wasn't a welcoming from the original people of this country. Uh, it was into a different, uh, different setting. And I think that, and I bought into that system in that I was for a while an ambassador for Australia Day. I personally no longer support that. But as a person who came here, the way it was, uh, the way I understood it was that um, it was an appreciation for the country that I had arrived in to engage in the participation of celebrating this day. But I had little knowledge that it was a day that was deeply offensive and hurtful to indigenous people. It marked to them the beginning of a really long battle in which they continue to fight um, even today. But I had no appreciation of that. Um, and another way in which I have seen my own privilege oper operate is the way in which, because people assume that as, as I am a black person, that somehow I can speak on topic of racism that cover even the indigenous people's perspective. And so what we become as settlers, women without knowing, is that we begin to erase indigenous women and indigenous people voices if we're not careful. And what I've tried to learn from that process is to always insist whenever I'm invited into panels, whether it's media or not, whether there's been an extended invitation to a person of indigenous background to speak on that. Because I think it's really wrong that when there's a topic and discussion about racism, that the first people that we go to are, you know, brown and black women who are settlers and not indigenous people. So I think that is one, some of the ways in which we, we can operate without even knowing or sometimes even, even knowing it, because I know members of South Sudanese community who claim that there's no racism in Australia. In, in a way, as a way of buying in to the system, the, 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 the mainstream system, so that they are better accommodated for, you know. And so they are buying into a hierarchy, hoping that they will not be on the bottom. And, and so they want to say there's no, there no discrimination in this country, there's no racism, because look at me, I came as a refugee and I'm making it, you know. So I think it's really important that when we talk about this issue of intersectionality and stuff, that we are able to go back and reflect our, at our own personal experiences. And what I hope we learn from this experience is not only just a sense of, okay, maybe I sort of mess up there, but to see how in the telling of our stories, we can begin to educate people within our own community about how to be better allies um, and, and, and lessen the impacts of intersectional violence on other people. I think also we have to do this act of unlearning, Miadol. You know, like uh, uh, my family migrated from Kenya to Nairobi, Kenya to Aotearoa, New Zealand, you know, and um, we, we didn't have the welcome that you're talking about. And um, we're, we're taught, at least I was taught, that... Uh, you know, to be respectable and to do all the right things, to make good on all the sacrifices that my family had made. And I think that's the migrant story. And I think um, one of the things that has to happen is, is the unlearning that we have to do to kind of um, start to see our complicity in um, the erasure or oppression of others. And I think... Um, uh, I just wanted to add a brief thought to what you said, Nyadol. Like, um, for me, the first sign of learning around my own privilege is when I feel um, angry or anxious or um, have a funny feeling in my, in my puku, in my tummy or in my heart, and, it's, and I feel like I need to be defensive. That, that's usually a sign that there's a, a big learning to happen. So um, thank you for for raising that issue of how our privilege might shift in different positions and in different contexts, and we might be simultaneously oppressed and privileged uh, in the one body. One of my favorite stories was when um, it's almost like entering from a space of less privilege to a space of more privilege was when uh, a friends, friends of my Asian friends went from 
um, who are based in Australia went to Singapore, for example, where it's a predominantly Chinese uh, society and, and they're kind of uh, the more privileged standing within that country. And just sort of experiencing that difference there was made them realize, oh, wow, so this is how privilege feels like. It's kind of nice, <laughs> you know. Was, everything seems to just work. <laughs> and then coming back to Australia, it just kind of just gives that highlight in, in that way. So in, in many ways, um, and I think that just really highlights that privilege uh, and, and standing changes in, in every setting, not just from from country to country, but also from setting to setting, from your work setting to your home setting to, to your various community settings as well. If I could come in with the Muslim experience after 9-11, because that was uh, for Lebanese Muslims and not just Muslims, people of Lebanese background had been, um, not to the extent I think of Vietnamese and other Southeast Asian migrants, but during the 90s, during the lead up to the 9-11 years, there'd been all this stuff about, you know, crime gangs and cabramada and, and, you know, and, and drugs. And now all of a sudden it was about terrorism and national security. But because Lebanese Muslims had already been stigmatised in the 90s as sort of crime gangs, and so Muslims of South Asian background, which is mine, I will say, were very, their instinctive immediate post 9 11 reaction was to say, oh, but that's the Lebanese Muslims. You have to understand we're not all the same. You know, we're, we're, we're the good ones. And we came here as skilled migrants and they came in as refugees and they're not so educated. And, and they were colonized by the French. We were colonized by the British. Listen to our accent. Sorry. And, um, yeah, and, you know, then, and also because the Sydney gang rapes, also called Sydney gang rapes, which happened around the same time as the 9-11 attacks and where the trials for that dragged on for years was also mostly Lebanese offenders in that case. But then there were then some other very notorious gang rapes where the criminals were, where the offenders were Pakistani background. So the Pakistani um, pitch on, oh, it's, it's the lapse, it's the lapse, and that kind of finger pointing. Okay. But yeah, and I think that I hope we don't navigate that issue as clumsily and as problematically as we did at that stage. But it still emerges, and you still hear it. And even if it's said less publicly, but there's still a, a lot of it, you know, within community spaces. Um, in and yeah, anyhow. Not a lot of solidarity. And that's the thing with discrimination, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, when they start having uh, minority groups being pitted against each other, um, that's, that's when they start to win. They being, you know, the non-minority, the majority, I suppose. Um, and, and certainly that's, you know, uh, been the case for a lot of my, migrant groups being uh, anti um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, like, where did that come from? It makes no sense. You know, it must have come from some media, some kind of learnings where these migrant groups are picking up these level of racism that technically wouldn't have been there before. So it's just really having a deeper understanding that with, with intersectionality, we're able, able to break down and understand where our um, discrimination comes from um, in order to try and continue to build communities together as opposed to tearing them apart. I'm actually and fascinated by, I'm actually, uh, sorry. No, go, you go, you go. I'm fascinated by that point, by the point that you mentioned about how um, communities are placed against each other. And I think even for, and, and it's interesting that that tends to come from people who would actually say they do not understand what this intersectionality means. But I think that that playing of community against each other is, is, a very good understanding of how intersectionality work, but an inversion of it, so that you're using it to exploit the differences and to exploit the, the privileges and say, okay, if if you, you know, if you don't say something about these Sudanese gangs, you know, then the whole immigration system is going to be under under threat. And people like you who come here and succeed might not be able to bring in your families. You know, uh, on these gangs are within your community and they might be able to attack, you know, your homes or take your car and stuff. So 
I think it's a really smart way of actually understanding intersectionality and like turning it upside down for political use. So it, it is telling that, you know, we live in a, space, in a space where we have to somehow find a way of reclaiming it because from my experience, when I've talked to people about the notion of intersectionality, you get a level of resistance um, in, in almost as if, a resistance as if you've accused them of, of something, of not understanding something, and also resistance in what do I have to give up, you know, if, if I participate in this, um, in this, um, in this process. Um, and there is a giving up, I think. There is a giving up sometimes of ideas and opinions and beliefs. That, that, that you've had, and that can be painful, whether you are talking about political and, and social concepts like intersectionality, or we're talking about just deeply personal stuff. That transformative way of trying to grow as a person is always difficult. It feels like, you know, sometimes pulling a tooth. Um, but I think when I think of intersectionality, um, I think of it as a way of, you know, a move from entitlement. It's, it's, we, we generally, when we talk about entitlement as a society, we see it as something slightly, you know, it's been enhanced by capitalism and all that. But we, most people will think being, having a sense of entitlement is not a good thing. But I, and I think intersectionality is the reverse of that. It's saying, from where I stand, how does the world around me look like? Um, it's, you know, imbuing your own a sense of what you feel entitled to, the spaces you feel should cater for you, and understanding how they look like for different bodies, for different skin colors, for different genders, um, and appreciating that and um, what you're able to have, but also how you can you can help others in the process. I I think just linking into what you were saying um, and what Judy was saying, I was thinking about the issue of power. Because to me, this is why the intersectionality conversation is important. Because um, that strategy of creating competing others and um, cultivating a scarcity mentality means that fear um, is what drives things. Um, so in terms of power, I think it's really interesting and useful to think about who's benefiting from the, the act of pitting groups against each other. Um, what is being valued? You know, what, what, what kind of um, people and positions and ways of being are being valued? And what is the effect and outcomes of this kind of thinking? Um, yeah. I can give an example of um, who benefits from pitting um, groups against each other. Um, this is back when they had the same-sex plebiscite um, and there was a heavier campaign and more funding by the no vote towards migrant groups. Uh, and, and so what happened was with a more funding and, and better campaigning for the no within migrant groups is um, some migrant groups had a higher no vote. But of course, what happens immediately after the yes vote was won, what's the first thing that the media presents on? They present on, here are all the migrant groups that voted no. And, and, and it's another example of, how would you say, um, the, the people that benefit from that are the people who are able to say, okay, you see, the, these are the migrant people um, that were never um, on the Australian side who voted yes in the first place, which was never really the case. It was just uh, a, a case of, you know, they were able to, uh, put themselves within, um, I think, um, a, a group that was easier for, from their perspective to access and to change the minds to participate within the no vote. And so for me, that, that was a very clear example of pitting groups against each other to the detriment of the minority groups themselves and who, who, who wins are the, the person who, or the community that wins are the community that want to see this division and, and, and want to see this drama unfold. Um, on the same sex marriage issue, well, not so much the same sex marriage, but on the issue of the sort of conservative religious to a very same sex marriage case, Disabled people don't have a uniform view on this particular topic, but which is euthanasia. 
But for many disability activists, that has been a very important topic. Victoria, as many of you will know, legalised, um, well, assisted dying legislation. I don't like that euphemism. To me, it's euthanasia. Anyhow, this is last year and and many disabled activists including me campaigned very hard against that not on a right to life basis but because it's inherently discriminatory to me and to others that it's saying that some types of lives are you know are so not worth living that we should help people to end them well at others who express the desire to end their lives it would be a medical professional's job to talk them out of that but but without going into the contours of that particular debate. Of course, you can imagine that conservative religious groups were keen to back us to the hilt on that one. And I was uncomfortable and taken aback to see, and particularly given that on the Muslim issue, of course, they're like <laughs> not exactly friends, you know, to have these conservative Christians suddenly wanting to be my bestie because I have articles I've published on this topic. And I really was, um, I don't, well, I navigated it by just evading it, basically. But it didn't serve our interests, I don't think, because then it allowed that to be represented. And Andrew Denton, who was very prominent on the, and on the, in support of the euthanasia debate, kept saying, well, if you dig deeply enough, you'll always find that it's always the conservative Christians who are behind it. Even if they say it's disability rights, it's not, it's the Catholic Church. Okay. No, it's not. They've jumped on board our campaign. We didn't invite them here. Um, but anyhow, um, sorry, um, I'm not quite sure how intersectionality fits into that, but it was, well, it was the mention of conservative religious organisations and the way that that can um, the well the let's just say ructions that that can cause <laughs> when they're harnessed to other identities. Thank you, Shakira. I really like this discussion. Um, how this discussion has um, we've started talking about privilege, and I. There is a question in the, from someone in the attendees about privilege that I think is quite well fitting um, in where we are with this discussion. So I'll just take it now, but we'll get to more questions later. Um, so it's from Hala Nasr. I'm interested in how the very neoliberal racist structures we are trying to dismantle seem to have infiltrated discussion of privilege and power. For example, individuals recognizing privilege and thinking that they have done their job. What do the panelists think? Who would like to respond to that? I think that press language is always um, um, is always a tool of. Um, I was saying, first, I think it's always a tool of taking the message and then narrowing it da down to something appropriate for the capitalist system in the first place or for the political interest or the particular interest of that organization. Um, and so for, you see now, even with racism, how the language is used, but really the, 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 it, what is really concerned is, you know, racism against, you know, white people and, and white men. And all of a sudden, the language that was developed by those who were oppressed, you know, is, um, is then utilized. And what I found both concerning and also just fascinating as, as just observing the world around me was the commercialization of the language that was coming out during the Black Lives Movement. All of a sudden, these major organizations, the big organizations, were issuing statements about Black Life, really, that Black Life matters. I think that's irrelevant because, you know, that statement would be made redundant if you are actually practicing this concept that Black Life matters. If it's reflected in your leadership appointments, it's ref reflected in your employment practices, if it's reflected in your uh, pol uh, policy positions about how you deal with discrimination when it comes, in, uh, when, when it happens. What this, I think, exposes 
is either first a very shallow understanding, you know, some people might have good intention, but they really have shallow understanding of what the structural changes would, would, would look like. Um, and I think the, at, at its most intel, intelligent in a bad way, it's a very useful way of ensuring that actions do not progress ahead. Because the, all you have to really do is, you know, stick up something on Twitter, say Black Lives Matters, or Disabilities Life Matters, or something like that, and then and then you're sort of like you've done you've done doing your performance um, towards um, that very that very important um, issue. And it, you know, it's also not something that you see. I'll have to say, or I don't think it's something that you see only in in the right. I think sometimes you see it operate even within um, what is left or center left, and and. Um, you see it in really, really glamorous policy statements, really, really glamorous reports, but still, you know, a good example is SBS. You know, his whole leadership structure was sort of predominantly white. And this was supposed to be a, a, a thing set up really to diversify uh, the Australian median landscape that is, that is, you know, that is supposed to be, um, uh, 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 they're supposed to be representative of us. Now, the clear example is not that be, you know the, these oil companies are necessarily right, but it was blowing up an indigenous um, uh, a, a, a structure. Or a, 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 I think it was a cave or something that had significant indigenous features. And she was getting to the good part too. <laughs> oh no. Would one of you um, like to jump in on that point while we wait for Nerul to connect back? I think, um, I think there, there's time for change right now. And um, perhaps, um, you know, thinking about the context of COVID and Black Lives Matter, we've begun seeing the ways in which um, the, the impacts of COVID have both been racialized. Um, we, we've needed to have a gender lens, uh, a, a sexuality. We, we've needed to have all the lenses of all the social categories because um, what we've learned is that the pandemic finds the fault lines or the fracture lines and um, has devastating consequences for all of us. And I, and I guess that, that's what I was reflecting on when uh, Nyadol was talking. I was thinking about um, how, how do we do this very, very strange thing, which is to somehow, um, you know, Im imagine and understand these different identities all at the same time. You know, how do we think about all these differences at once? Um, because um, they affect who we think we are, this is what Carol de Cruz says, um, who others think we are, and what kind of life chances we acquire uh, based on these markers of difference. So, um, you know, like for me, uh, there's something about the confluence of COVID and Black Lives Matter that has made people who were never in a position to really think about these things. And, and, and I'm concerned um, about why we have to experience something before we can care about it, you know? Like, how do we create the circumstances under which we can think about what these things might mean for everybody? And, and I guess what I'm saying is, you know, do we have to be temporarily disabled to understand disability? Do we need to see a washed up little boy on the beach like we did a few years ago to care about uh, refugee ch children, refugee background children. Um, can we use the idea of intersectionality and this web of influences to somehow think about how one little tension on a web, and I'm, I'm thinking about a spider and a spider web here, but one little pull on a tiny part of the web actually has an impact on all of the web. And, and if I think about that uh, as myself, who's not really an individual, I'm part of families and communities, but, but everyone that's part of my web and the bigger web, you know, not, not just the virtual web, but um, our web of connections. That was a bit rambly, sorry.
Neandol, did you want to pick up where you left off? Sorry, we. No, that I, I was, I yeah, I was, I was trying to to explain how um you know the co-opting of 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 the victim's language can can be used as a way of narrowing the debate or indeed extinguishing the debate itself by either projecting an idea that uh, we've done something so it's settled. Um, or in fact that those people have seen the whole problem wrong. What is the problem is not racism, is reverse racism, for example. Um, but I think that that tell us that when it comes to this, uh, this uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say tell us, but I say that, that to me, when I think about um, the progress that we're trying to achieve by understanding the intersection of violence and discrimination and oppression, um, is that this is a really long-term project. Um, in, 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 no, in no small way, some of it is supposed to be technically revolutionary. We're trying to change the very way, the very systems that we have in place that have, that have assumed, um, in, uh, whether intentionally or not, a structure of, 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 or a hierarchy of, of, of people and where we all fall that and how we fall out of those, those spaces. So I think it also requires a, a level from us of, of patience. Um, um, not patience toward oppression, but patience to under understanding that the achievements are, are not necessarily going to um, uh, come um, overnight. And sometimes you see the exhaustion from, from say, allies when, when they make mistakes in their interaction or their support and they're blamed. They think this is the kind of thing that make people not want to support you. You know, that's the statement that comes out of frustration. I'm trying my best to be engaged in being an ally. And yes, I'm failing, but you know, your reaction is making me want to give up. In supporting you, and I think that it, that, that become uh, uh, come from an exhaustion of, of not understanding that this is a long term project. This is a long term investment in trying to create a more more positive um, world. But it's also challenging, even I think, for those who are experiencing oppression, because when you are in a position of disadvantage as a, as an indigenous person or a person of disability, you are tired of waiting. You know, I think James Bolden summarized it real, really nicely in a quote where he say, you know, how long should I wait for your progress? You know, um, and, but, but I think that, uh, and this is where I have in my, uh, experienced a level of, uh, of conflict, personal in, in some ways, in how do you um, engage with somebody who wants to be an ally, but is struggling in, 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 in that process because it's a learning process. It's not, you know, people don't arrive at allyship. It's complete, you know, well-knowing and stuff. And sometimes I struggle with the reaction I see, which can be very, very, very damaging to the other person, even as they try to be allies and support. Because when they fail, the reaction is, you failed us again after going through so much oppression, we can now not rely on your allyship. And I think that is a room for us to define what it is. Where is the space for learning um, um, uh, for, for the allies? Because if silence is, is, um, if silence is uh, being complicit and speaking up is not perfect, where does that leave those who want to be allies. If teaching them is exhausting for us, they have to go and do their own work. But in the process of doing their own work, they don't do it well. And we blame them. Where is our extension of how far can we educate without exhausting ourselves? Um, and so I think this is where, for me, I really, really struggle because I think sometimes the concept of wokeness, if we are to accept that, you know, uh, that we want to participate in helping others change and helping ourselves change, then wokeness cannot be performative. And inherently, the very act of people engaging in wanting to change processes and system is an act of changing themselves and that come with them being able to make errors. Where is the space for our lives to make errors? You know, I'm really interested in that because I think it's still a very contentious place, particularly if you consider yourself to be in the, in, the, in, in the center life. And I think sometimes we, you know, even the progressive, cost ourselves um, long-term allies in the process of short-time fighting without real gains. I think also, Nyadol, you said that so beautifully. I think part of the problem, I, I think, is that 
everything is so accelerated. And, um, you know, when, when we first started going online, returning to the idea of the virtual, it sort of feel, felt like there was a space where you could have this asynchronous kind of learning, where there'd be an opportunity to read something. You know, I remember being so excited when I got an email, like, oh, oh, you know, and, and writing something and then waiting to hear someone respond, which would sometimes be hours, maybe days, but it was so exciting because there was this feedback mechanism. And then it's become highly accelerated. So the space to just sit with discomfort, the sit, uh, the, the the chance to make a mistake is uh, is is no longer available to us. So um, you know you might misgender someone accidentally. You might um, use the wrong word, um, and then before you know it, um, you're a pariah. And I think you know how do we how do we take people along with us in our journey, but also let ourselves, I mean, uh, in terms of allies, um, encourage them to let us take a lead because um, you Could have- Could that suggest that forgiveness is important here? And that um, maybe allies could perhaps accept that, I'm gonna speak again through, with my, through the disability lens because they're often in a lot of physical pain, you know. Don't expect us not to be short-tempered when we're, you know, physically hurting all over, when we've made the physical effort to be there and to be talking and actually we're in the most, you know, and actually I'm not feeling so great today myself, you know, but here we are. Don't expect us to always be endlessly patient. So expect that if you fuck up and, excuse language and all, we're going to get sweary, we're going to get angry, we're going to lose our temper at you, but that doesn't mean that we never want to speak to you again. But also don't dismiss it as she was just having a bad day. Take what we say and think about it and consider what it is that might have provoked that reaction. But also know that, you know, that we're not, oh, well, sometimes it does happen. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But the, we, the people as in the whoever it is that's lost their temper, um, that, that, we can we can be friends again tomorrow and that friends and allies ought to be able to have those conversations and allies um you know shouldn't retreat wounded and um and nurse that herd and not come back and say okay let's start again and i, I yeah I might have not, I might have not made that point clear, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and I think that's the point I was trying to make when I said, um, you know, sometimes it's also not useful when the reaction of the allies are, well, I try my best, you guys are just trying to you know, attack us, not giving us room to grow. And then, you know, this is why it's hard to support the cause. Um, the cause has to be a personal commitment for each of us, you know, it, it, because either it's all aligned with our with, um, with the kind of the way we want the world to be fairer for everybody else. And so um, even an angry reaction from somebody else, to me, is not a justification for giving up on the cause. The cause still remain an important cause, even if you had interacted with somebody that had not been ideal. So, no, um, I, I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Shakira. I, I think you, you know, um, and I, I think there is, the, the, there is a huge punch to what you said. And not forgetting, at the end of the day, if, if an ally is thinking, well, I've done my bit and it feels like that's all, I mean, um, and then that's, that's it. I feel like I can't do it anymore. Perhaps, you know, it, it's calls for a bit of self-reflection of where is this coming from? Where is this sense of allyship coming from? Is it coming from a sense where you want to provide this allyship in return? And, and, that, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with this. In return for, you know, feeling better about yourself, then that potentially is a, a weaker foundation for which your ally, allyship stands, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, people are people. And that's one of the things to, and that's one of the beautiful things that we should be embracing, diverse, diversity. You know, we all have good days, we all have bad days, we all react differently. And if your allyship is fragile in that, if someone has a bad day and it shakes your foundation of allyship, then that's something to really self-reflect on 
on, on, on what foundations your allyship are based on and, and to potentially change that into stronger foundations, um, stronger foundation being not related to your own uh, sense of achievement or, or sense of gratification and in, into something where it's, hey, this is actually a thing. You know, I, you know tear me down 10 times and I'll stand up 11 times um, because I, I believe in this cause. So for me, it's um, that, that level of importance of self-reflection from the allies perspective, but also understand um, from us um, who uh, benefit from the, the allyship also, you know, giving them that space of self-reflection and growth as well. Thank you. Um, I might just start, start taking more questions. I'm mindful of the time. We have 25 minutes to the end and there are a lot of questions coming in, which are all really, really um, relevant and important. Um, I think the discussion that we just had about privilege and um, the, move, the shift from acknowledging privilege to taking responsibility addresses some of the questions in there already. So for example, there was a question about how, how do we have the difficult conversations about power, privilege, and giving up what we have. And I think we have already um, addressed that point to some extent in the discussion. And there was a question about how uh, migrants who um, have a certain level of privilege and in the, coming to the Western countries and using that privilege, but also um, raising their voice about, against the racism and against injustices that are committed towards them as migrants, still go back to their home countries and continue to live privileged lives and um, benefit from the um, oppression and um, under um, under representation of other people. So uh, how, how, and I think that's also the same sort of question about while we may become aware of cer certain issues because we are in an underprivileged position in a certain context, and then we go back and we are not able to apply that lens and flip it and see where we are privileged and um, we might be. Um, perpetuating inequalities. So I think um, those points have been addressed to some extent. There was I also a think Nadol, sorry, I also think Nadol spoke about this beautifully when asking the question, you know, am I the right person to be in this conversation? Should there be other people that are not in this conversation? And, and those are, I think are really important questions. And I think, um, for many of us who've tried hard to get a platform, um, that can be really kind of challenging when we get offered one, you know, to then say, oh, you know, uh, I really want to be able to speak because I never get to speak, but there are other people who are better than me. So I, I think this is a, a big learning. And it's all, it also points to the structural, which is why is the table built, you know, that we're being invited to sit at, why is the table so small? Why can't more of us be at this table? Yeah. Uh, th there's a point you made there about how some, some of us here come and benefit, well, maybe benefit from the system here, and, but also participate in oppression back home, I think that's, you know, or, or systems of oppression from our original from. And, um, and I think that goes to the point of how insidious privilege is. You don't see it most of the time. You don't see how it, and then of course that is layered with the psychological nature of all of us to always, in, in, in some ways, um, you know, sh look away from those things that point a bad finger at us. We tend to see what other people do, do wrong. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I've, um, I'll, give you an, I'll give you all an example. The African gang, um, gang issue, um, came after the South, South, South Sudanese Civil War. And the South Sudanese Civil War was a very divisive war. Um, it was fought along very, very, um, very, uh, very tribal, tribal li uh, lines. And I remember some of the people that were anti-African gang were quite actively engaged in the political conversation that was happening in South Sudan in a very oppressive way clearly very oppressive way, taking what it's actually to me, the very opposite. And I, and I couldn't reconcile the two. I, I, I was thinking, well, if you can see oppression in, in one, because you are a victim of oppression here, how could you not see that it's the same dynamic, just different players? Um, 
different players back home. So it's, 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 I find that interesting as an observer because I, I tend to sit around and just observe it, observe the things happening and, 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 and suppose think about it. But it's, 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 it's a legitimate issue. And that might be, and that might be, I mean, I, I laugh, but if you take away the laugh, this is serious because some of the places people are being killed, you know, in South Sudan, journalists are murdered for, for speaking up. People are in prison indefinitely for, for, for standing up. Uh, and, and swing up a about a government who've barely had any elections back in South Sudan. So it's real things, but but you can see people living here enjoying the democratic systems, the democratic systems here, supporting these regimes that are doing the, exactly the opposite of what they, they are enjoying. And, and to me, it's a, it's a really um, difficult thing to reconcile. Uh, a, a, to, to reconcile how anyone can, can kind of sort of um, do that. But, you know, I think when you are the oppressor, it's harder to see that you are the oppressor because you have systems that justify why things are the way they are. Yep. And that's, that's beautifully answered. Um, I think the next question that I would like to take is uh, from Jamal Hakim. Often a dilemma in intersectionality is the attack from both advocates and detractors is a question on where does, where does intersectionality stop and questions around how many voices need to be heard when delivering something in practical terms. What do you think leaders working to build intersectionality over time practically do to start the process and simultaneously address negative rhetoric that can be otherwise demotivating in building the space. I was going to say, I'm a visual person. I'm going to have to see that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's essentially um, the similar sort of, um, I guess what um, the person is trying to ask is how, when, when this argument is made that intersection, intersectionality is too complex when we have to do it in practice. And how do we, is it possible, how is it possible to hear voices on intersections of all sorts of margins and all sorts of discriminatory systems when decision makers and policy makers and people who are trying to implement something in practice are trying to simplify things they don't want complexity they don't want to deal with um, too many voices um, and is there a, a practical advice you would like to give in that sort of situation where we can deal with complexity without having to reduce it or oversimplify it? I think that, um, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about for the last couple of years is that the, the problems defined as organizations or institutions not being representative of the community. And so then of communities, I should say, and then there's been a very additive approach to that, which is like, oh, we'll just, we'll just add this person who has these attributes that are missing from the organization and stir. But the problem is the structure and the purpose and the function and the way of doing things remains the same. And uh, I remember um, someone from Black Lives Matter, whose name has escaped me, but I'll remember as soon as this finishes, saying presence doesn't equal power. So I also think it's about critical mass. I think it's about worldviews um, and different ways of thinking and being and how much space there is for them. I'm sure I've probably gone off track because this Zoom thing is so kind of, conf you know, it's so, so much harder to kind of train your thoughts. But um, yeah, that's what I was thinking when you were talking. I think... At the end of the day, just probably um, Virginia just sort of mentioned, how can you have simple solutions uh, to complex issues? Not that intersectionally is that complex. Um, people who embody it can tell you exactly what it is. Problem is that intersectionality is seen as additive rather than overlapping systems of oppression. And I totally agree with that. I think um, 
unfortunately, you know, the, some of the foundations are built on is, okay, now exactly like Ruth mentioned, okay, now we have to consider disability. Let's add a, this checklist to it. Now we need to consider LGBTIQ. Let's add this person. Let's add this checklist. And it's not an additive process. Um, when, you, when, when we look at it from an additive perspective, of course it becomes exhausting because then it looks like it's another thing to add on. Um, but having an intersectional lens is understanding that web that Ruth was talking about um, and, and providing access to opportunities uh, on across all levels, not necessarily just showing you have this checklist done. I think um, I hope that answers the question in, in, in that sense, how to simplify it um, in some ways. And, and by adding a list is, uh, or, or, you know, ticking something off a box is not the simple way of fixing. Mm. I tick issue. Canada a lot of boxes. Yeah. I, get, I get put on a lot of lists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody give me a goddamn job already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I would say that the question we sh shouldn't we shouldn't be asking how many voices do we need to hear. We should be asking how many how do we hear, how do we listen, rather than asking how many voices do we need to listen to. So it's really about the about the approach and the process rather than counting and adding the number yeah. of voices that we wanting to hear. That. So I think at the end of the day, if we're talking about, you know, with my analogy of a seat at the table, it's we don't want everyone to have a seat at that table, but everyone wants to know that if they wanted that seat, they have the same opportunity to apply to be on that seat. Um, and, and the barriers that each everyone has to access that seat is the same. There is no more barriers for a particular person um, over another. So I think that's probably the way that I would look at it. So some of the other questions are asking about self-interest, um, capitalism that makes people want to uh, move upwardly, um, do do good things for themselves and their families. So essentially the things we have um, mentioned already, self-interest and advancement, um, the overarching uh, capitalism that people are buying into, and how is how how do we deal with uh, how do we do intersectionality when people are essentially self interested or there is the inherent human nature regardless of one's social or political background or status to be self interested i mean i don't i don't i i don't think it is possible uh, for any human being to utterly somehow disconnect from all the upbringing, you know, in a family, in a society, in the political system, in an economic system. I, I think it's a it's one of those things that I think it's a learning until uh, until death. You know, it's a shedding of oneself and 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 and. And and I suppose uh, recreating oneself. Um, I have I have changed a lot. You know, a lot of what is politic is personal. I came from, and when I when I go back to my experiences, I hope it doesn't sound very narcissistic, but I but I find it more grounding when you can give examples and also less blaming and finger pointing because it's able to demonstrate my own failures. So I come from a, I come from a, a, a very socially conservative background. You know, South Sudanese are very socially conservatives. You know, we were the kind of people that would have exactly voted against marriage equality. In fact, I think when I told my mom that I supported marriage equality, her words to me, sorry, I was trying not to identify how I was supposed to say a relative. Um, her words to me was, um, I wish God never gives you any form of power, you know, because she has, because, you know, because the, she has, she was brought up as a very religious, woman from a young age. That's her world. That's the world I, I grew up in. And so my first formed opinions, you know, about uh, a different, uh, uh, you know, not a different, but another sexuality was completely compressed. I only knew and grew up in a society that had language for only marriage in a very singular way. 
that has ideas of who can participate in it in a very singular way. I did not grow up with any other language, any other concepts. So when I stepped to this country, it was a process of shedding and a process of giving up an entire way of, what, of, of how I was brought up. And, and so I think that all of us comes into this space of intersectionality, come into the space of discussing political opinions, all these things that we have to, to, to engage with, we also bring our own personal luggage into it. Um, and that complicates things. And, um, I suppose the only way I can try and give it a positive form is that sometimes we do need to freeze that we will never enjoy the shade. That is the kindness of humanity. We do things, not because they're charitable, not because we benefit from them, but because to a large degree, it brings a much more significant change and worth to somebody else's life and probably maybe just inconvenience you a little. I think your point also about that intergenerational impact is really powerful because I think when we're talking about being diasporic, um, there's something about migration that is a break in culture that you're talking about, Nadol. You know, that, um, you know, it's a little bit like studying. Uh, you know, all of us have done some study. It's like you don't do it to remain the same person. And with migration, you don't do it to remain the same, you know. Um, for I mean, I know it's sometimes it's forced, uh, unwanted, um, because of all kinds of constraints and pressures. Um, but I think that the next generation are put in a position where they do have an opportunity to kind of evaluate the values of their heritage plus the new values. And um, when I hear my parents correcting people who are um, saying shit, <laughs> <laughs> I feel really proud because it's like, oh, they listen to all my lectures, you know, and when I've had fights with my parents and my sister says, didn't you want her to get a good education in another country? Didn't you want her to have a PhD? Well, this is why she's so bullshit because this is what you wanted and this is the other side of it. I, I have to run because I have to go and uh, pick up my children. Um, intersectionality there, a mom. <laughs> but I, I'm hoping that all of you um, stay well. I'm really sorry for the rat all. Thank you so all right. much, all. Thank you for joining us. And it has been an incredible discussion and all of your contributions are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Shakira, there is a question for you um, because you mentioned the turn policing and um, some Buddy is asking, it's an anonymous um, attendee, they're asking how, as women of color, do you deal with people who turn, po turn police and minimize your responses? Um, sorry, I didn't catch the beginning of that. I got the bit about turn policing. How, as a woman of color, do you deal with people who turn police and minimize your responses? I'm not sure if this quite answers the question. I struggle with some very ableist language that I hear from within the anti-racist movement sometimes, um, well, actually, often in fact. And um, <clears throat> because I know that it's a new concept for people, well, I see people using the word blind as a metaphor actually in the tweets about this. I don't know whether one of the panelists used it. I mean, it's, it was being literally crippled that made me realise that actually talking about a policy or a or an initiative as 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 being crippling or debt as being crippling. So, hmm, okay, I suddenly see that metaphor in a new way. So I'm still learning myself, and I try to acknowledge that when pointing out to other people. But maybe you know, um, maybe there's and maybe there's a word that one could use other than blind, you know, and different to or whatever it is that you're trying to say, to say that instead. And um, and I hope that by acknowledging that it's, you know, that it's a learning process for me too, for all of us, that that might help. But that still doesn't stop people from sometimes responding extremely aggressively if they're used to always feeling like they're in the right. Like I had some extremely, um, you know, and aggressively defensive conversations with some experienced and high profile 
anti-racist activists and scholars over whether it was okay to use the R word, which I'll let you Google what the R word is if you don't, you collect anybody who doesn't already know. Um, and that, you know, if you wouldn't use the N word, then you really shouldn't use the R word. And they were so, 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 like, whether there's a hierarchy with the R word is as bad as, or not quite as bad as, or nearly as bad as, or whatever, than the N word, that isn't the point. It doesn't matter whether it's only half as offensive as the N word, it's offensive, don't say it, don't use it. You know, I have a neurological disease. And if we talk about privilege, on the one hand, I'm very defensive in saying that actually it's not affecting my cognition. I'm still getting peer reviewed journal articles published. My book got a fabulous review in the Times Literary Supplement. Go Google me. Blah. Sorry. I don't I get an income bragging is the only gratification I'm getting from my academic output at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But anyways, but I'm aware that in um, defending myself in that way, that that's also an implicit put down of people who do have cognitive impair impairments and who in fact might have the kind of emotional intelligence that I myself often lack and that the people who I might be in conversation with often lack as well. So I shouldn't um, tone police in a way that not only demeans the person that I'm speaking to, but also demeans a whole other cohort of people that we're just shrugging off as irrelevant people, you know, like if you call somebody stupid, you're not just putting down the person you're speaking to who probably isn't in IQ terms. You're also putting down people um, with, with cognitive impairments, but who still make a valuable contribution and who still, as I say, can have an extremely high level of emotional intelligence and insight and know when you're insulting them too. Sorry, I realise that was a very roundabout response, but... <laughs> No, that's that's perfectly fine, and it it touches on a really important um, issue around language more broadly as well. How it, because tone policing does not necessarily uh, is not necessarily restricted to the way you're talking, but also the use of the certain words and all of that as well. So it's, I think it's really relevant. Um, we have two minutes to go, and um, Bruce, would you mind if I use the quote you shared with us yesterday to end this session because it was just so beautiful and moving. I have been reading it over and over again since yesterday, and it's, I think it's, it's a beautiful note to end the session on. Please do. Thank you. So Ruth shared this quote um, with us um, yesterday, and it says, he could not see that I could be both. The body in front of him was already inscribed within the gendered social relations of the colonial sandwich. I could not just be, I had to name an identity. No matter what this naming rendered invisible, all the other identities of gender, caste, religion, linguistic group, generation, and so on. So um, we have talked about compartmentalization and forced compartmentalization of identities that are socially constructed and socially ascribed by the power structures that exist and that um, in the sole purpose of constructing those identities also to keep people in their place. And then asking people to identify themselves with something and um, be one thing and not the other or be something that they recognize and not something that they do not recognize is really the problem that we that intersectionality aims to address and that we're trying to um, get to and we'll continue these conversations um, please join us for the next webinar on 3rd of September where we we'll talk a bit more about um, the issue of violence more specifically and how uh, can we talk about violence in multicultural communities without um, labeling it or otherizing the communities as complex forms of violence, um, which is a predo um, predominant or dominant way of talking about violence in certain communities these days. Thank you very much to everyone who joined and stayed throughout the whole panel discussion. It is really incredible to see that much so much interest in this topic and such vibrant discussions. We couldn't get to all the questions, but thank you for everyone who has sent in, in their comments um, and questions throughout. And we'll put the recording of this webinar up soon. Thank you. Have a nice thank evening. You.